All right, good morning, everybody. Apologies for the late start. We are experiencing some technical difficulties there for a minute, but we have everything figured out. Uh, this morning, we are excited to Jessica, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, you're on mute. I don't know how that happened. OK, OK, we're going to start you. this again. I'm sorry. Um, so this morning we have Timothy Maloney here uh, excited to talk about stock degradation. Apologies for the technical difficulties we've had today, um, but this morning we have Tim. He is a PhD for an from Agritech Consulting in Whitewater, Wisconsin. He's a production research agronomist and has worked in crop research since 1993. He has interest in all aspects of crop production from agronomy with genetics, fertility, and biologicals. And he has interest also to soils and disease and pest management. He's interested in how they interact with each other uh, in order to enhance yield and profitability. So that is the introduction that Tim provided, but I wanted to give a little bit of our background with Tim. He is a research farm that we utilize with all, uh, all of our research up in Wisconsin. And we have learned an abundance from Tim in our workings together. Um, so he's a really amazing resource and we talk all of the time about how he is basically a gold standard for a research farm. Um, so we're very excited to have him and very grateful for his uh, willingness to speak on the topic of stock degradation today. So with that, I will hand it over to Tim to educate the group on the topic of stock degradation. Really apologize. I'm not sure why you can't do the video today, but um, it's a pretty exciting subject if you just have to hear my voice, I guess. Um, uh, yes, we've we've had a really good relationship with Andersons, and uh, it's something that uh, I've enjoyed for I just won't say how many years, but it's been more than ten, I'm sure. Um, it just it, it's something about stock degradation sounds like a pretty boring subject, but it's really not. It isn't just about rotting some residue out there and and getting it to go away. It's really to see if we can tap into what's there and utilize it pretty much as, as quickly as we can. So um, our research is very much production oriented um, and all our research is in regular commercial fields and we just cut pieces out of it to do whatever we have to do. And um, so I, th I thought we could start our discussion looking at a field of green corn, which is what we were looking at a couple weeks ago, not now that it's so uh, maturing, but really this is where we're starting. We're looking at a standing crop and we need to be thinking about what we're going to do while it's green. And then where it's going to go to that is going to be this residue that, that gets thrown out of the combine. And we want to be careful about how the combine throws the residue. We want to be even as possible out in the field because it's how we manage that residue, which goes to the next slide, is our ultimate goal is next year. Um, next year and whether it's going to be a crop of corn or soybeans or wheat or anything else you could imagine, we want to take what's inherent in the residue of this year's crop. We've got nitrogen in there. We've got phosphorus in there. We've got potassium in there. We've got sulfur. We've got all kinds of things in there. We want to convert it back into something that we can use for the next year's crop. Uh, next slide. So stock degradation or residue decomposition, you know, you look at it in the fall, you're like, well, is it really that important? I'll just go get my chisel plow and I'll just bury it. Well, yeah, that's one way of managing residue, but we're not just physically managing the residue. We want to manage what the residue has inside and it is valuable in nutrients. It does add back to organic matter. Um, it's very important for the next crop because it will provide something to the next crop, whether it's a, a, a so-called nitrogen credit or whether it's, we just call it a rotation credit. Maybe we'll call it a disease management credit. Maybe we'll look at that as, well, let's see if we can break disease cycles or insect pest cycles. Um, residue does provide protection to the soil. 
So it it's like a, a mass, uh, a, a, you know, a mass of, of a thatch out there that can prevent against erosion, whether it's wind blown or, or water movement. So residue is really important. It's about as important as the crop that it came from. But with that, always, anything good always has a few things we have to worry about. A thick residue is going to inherently make that soil colder because the sunlight can't warm it up as much. Um, residue is going to tie up nutrients, which we would like to get back, and they don't give them up easily. Um, a thick residue is going to create potential problems at planting, which is why we need residue managers or trash whippers or things to move the management of that, 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 that residue at planting. Um, residue, as we know, carries diseases. It holds diseases. It gives them an overwintering site and also for pest management because insects and pests love to hide under that residue. So the next slide, I, I kind of broke down each title. Just give us something to chew on this morning. In, in every bushel of corn, we produce about 50 pounds of residue. If you think about that, that seems like a lot, but you know, a bushel of corn is a few plants of corn. But so we've got a lot of residue and we're not growing 100 bushel corn anymore. We're not trying to grow 200 bushel corn. We're trying to push it. So the harder we push our crop through our inputs, the result is we're going to have more residue to deal with. And the more residue we have to deal with, the more nutrients that are going to get tied up in that residue. So I just got a couple little numbers just basically in that uh, on a per acre basis, you might have about half your nitrogen and you apply that you're sitting out there in that residue. We've got phosphorus in there. We've got potassium in there. There's carbon in there. And I'm not going to go into carbon per se, but it's just there's nutrients in there. And there's nutrients that we want to see if we can, we can get again. Um, so uh, next slide is another thing is organic matter. Well, we all understand organic matter. The more organic matter in a soil, the darker the soil is potentially. When you go down south into Florida, you're, you're used to looking at these redder soils. Well, they don't have any organic matter in them because the, the sun, the weather is beating on them all the time. Fortunately for us in the Midwest, we do have organic matter and we can actually um, that increase it over time and we can manage it over time, but is it is a storehouse of nutrients and we want to tap into that all the time for our growing crops. So why is residue important to the next crop? On the next slide, it's if you think about this, the soil, we might call it dirt, we might call it soil. I guess this spring we all called it mud for a while, but the soil is what I call the soil solution, and it is like a um, it's like a grocery store if you want to put it that way. So where a grocery store has all kinds of food in it, the soil solution has a tremendous amount of food in it, and the rhizosphere is that area that surrounds the roots, and it is a kind of think of it as a fluid. Um, a fluid nutrient bed where nutrients go in and out of the plant as they go. So we want to tap into that. We want to be able to have the nutrients that are in there for our growing crop. And the big part about residue, which I haven't mentioned yet, has to do with microbes. Microbes are so important in the soil solution and in our soil. Um, there's earthworms in there, but it's the microbes are the ones that decay or degrade residue. And those are the ones that we need to learn more about. The microbes are what releases the nutrient. What the earthworm does, it kind of grinds up residue, but it also helps form water channels and things like that. But these microbes are so important. So on the next slide, we talk about soil microbes. And this is this is where the, the science comes in today or the soil chemistry. Think of a microbe as, as an organism that its sole purpose is to 
feed on what's in the soil. So there are microbes that are not good, and those could be more like pests, where you talk about nematodes and things like that. Or we go to insects that are like rootworms and things like that. But soil microbes are so important for soil health. They are active in recycling nutrients. Um, they're very important in the nitrogen cycle. But the two words we should probably discuss are immobilization and mineralization. So when we think of immobilization, that's where the microbes are chewing on that residue and they take that the, the fertility per se and they hold it into their bodies. Mineralization is when those, new, those microbes die and they release it back into the soil. And we want to promote that process. So uh, back in uh, early soil science, we learned about the carbon nitrogen ratio. And if you think about it, it's a balance that the bodies of the microbes need to have inside them. And a microbe loves to have an eight to 10 to one ratio. So let's just say 10 parts carbon, one part nitrogen. Well, that keeps their, their, their processes happy. Well, in decomposition, it's about 24 to one. And if we go higher than that, guess what? It's harder to break that residue down. So if you think about that, most people don't use soybeans for uh, bedding. We like to use wheat straw. We like to use maybe even corn stalks. Well, if you look at my, my little grid there, the more carbon in something, the longer it's going it, to, the better it's going to be as a, as a, uh, a manure, you know, like a, a bedding source. So that's why when you look at like even sawdust, if you look at sawdust, it, it takes those microbes so much nitrogen to break them down because they are so high in carbon alfalfa as we know if, if if you have a crop of alfalfa and you miss a part in the field that you didn't break the next cutting that alfalfa is usually about rotten well because it has a lower carbon nitrogen ratio corn as we know that residue sticks around for a couple years well it has a higher carbon nitrogen ratio it takes longer for it to decay so we need to be thinking about that. If it's something that we know sticks around, it's going to take the microbes a lot more nitrogen to break that carbon down. And that is kind of the crux of stock degradation. So be thinking ahead. I'll give you a little clue. When we think about it a little bit farther ahead in our discussion, when we want to encourage microbes to break down carbon, we need to feed them. So we can do it naturally just in the environment, but when we get to the very end of our discussion today, we're going to want to think about how can I encourage those microbes to eat faster, eat more efficiently to release those nutrients that we are going to want later. <laughs> so next slide. So I, I don't want to underestimate the importance of residue. It does protect the soil. It, it provides a good cover um, kind of like a cover crop if you want to look at it that way, but it also can create problems. So the next slide is residue covers, but it will potentially delay um, warm up of the soil in the spring. So if we have something that could maybe degrade residue more quickly, we might help warm that soil up in the spring, except for, especially if we're in a high residue, even a no-till situation. So that residue cover if we can feed those microbes we can actually enhance degradation and potentially eliminate some of those spring planting issues where we might have a poor initial uh, germination emergence and things like that and we can mechanically do that through our planters um we can have seed firmers we can we, we can manage that but i think we need to understand we need to try to feed these microbes a little bit because that is so important um, next slide, we have things like diseases and insects. Um, when we grow a crop year after year after year after year, the same crop, we are going to build up diseases over time. We know that if we grow soybeans every couple of years, usually our yields better. But when we grow soybeans more in a corn bean, corn bean rotation, we're more prone to things like brown stem rot or sudden death syndrome or even the buildup of soy cyst nematode because we're growing that crop longer. 
So if we grow that crop longer and we build up all this residue, we are going to potentially have an increased incidence in diseases and pests and things like that, even uh, rodents and such. So that's kind of my my oh my quick and dirty background of just residue and why we want to try to understand more about it. And uh, so my next slide is why do we have or why should we have a stock degradation program? This is the work we've been doing with the Andrews since the last few years where we're trying to say, can we manipulate, can we enhance, can we promote maybe a, a, a more aggressive stock degradation? Could we um, take, a, take a big corn crop and could we say, hey, over that winter time, can we get something on there? So we know we have warm days and these cold days in the winter, but if we can encourage this bacteria, these microbes, to feed and digest this, these new the, the nutrients in this this residue, what's that going to mean for the next year's crop? Well, I think it's a big deal, and it's tough to measure that kind of stuff, but there are benefits that we can look at. So, my next slide, I'm looking. I just have a couple of comments about well. What's the benefit of a good res res residue degradation program? Well, plain and simple, it's all about nutrients. We know nutrients aren't cheap, and we know our soils are not typically deficient in nutrients, but we know that they're often tied up in the residue. So let's get the nutrients back into production. Let's work on trying to warm our soil service a little bit. Let's improve the soil consistency because if we're able to create nutrients, uh, the, this residue, we're going to improve our soil consistency. And the ultimate goal is, well, planting, crop growth. Our seed placement is going to be better if we're not trying to plant seed in a, in a bunch of residue. Um, we're going to promote our germination, our emergence. We're going we're to promote a more uniform stand, even with all that trash out there. But we're going to utilize the microbes and the earthworms to our benefit, not just to theirs. And we're going to utilize this residue degradation to hopefully break some of these pest cycles, pest, pest cycles and, and some of the, the, the host populations that we have. So next slide. It, 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 this is just a picture that I took uh, last fall on some of our research trials. And to really test this stuff, you, you, you need to have dedicated areas for it, but you have to have it based on uniformity. And when you set up a research trial, you need a uniform. Um, actually, Jessica, if you think of this, where you see that white building, that's where we've had the residue trials over just north of there. So that's a familiar place for you. So, but we need to, to have an, a, an even platform. So. Um, when we go to the next slide and we're looking at residue research, um, we're, we're going to be looking at how we can utilize um, the technology we have. Um, Andersons have some wonderful products that, that we'll talk about. But when do we do this? Well, we want, we'd love to do this all in the fall if we can get that crop off soon enough because Obviously, in the Midwest, winter does happen and it does slow degradation down. But it, we need to have a plan so that as soon as that crop comes off, we're starting to make make attempts to um, get applications of, of of a product that helps break this residue down. So we were looking at and we are looking at fall applications. Uh, we're looking at potential of early spring applications. And my favorite, we're looking at fall and spring. Why two timings? Because we are beginning to learn no single mode of action works on anything anymore. We want multiple modes of action, multiple timings. If we're really going to try to get these microbes to do what we want and give that those nutrients back, we need to make sure that we are feeding them right at the right timing. So when we're doing this research, uh, we will go out and uh, we'll lightly mow. We'll, we'll make sure the residue is uniform. So when we're measuring things over the course of 
uh, basically now through next spring, we are measuring in a consistent area that we can get some degree of confidence in what we're looking at. So we're also going to be looking at the influence of temperature. So we'll take soil temperature ratings to see how that's affected by the different materials. We'll look at obviously a dry winter is going to probably have a negative impact on residue. Whereas if we can have rainfall or snow, that help actually snow helps a lot because it has this, you have this environment underneath where it doesn't really get super cold and those microbes are going to keep going. Um, in our research, we have weighed residue over time. We've also measured the percent residue out on the soil. Um, we can look at <clears throat> nutrient composition, but ultimately my favorite residue trial looks at the yield of the crop that follows it. So we have a next slide. So what, what kind of things are we thinking about? So do we just leave it to nature and say, hey, it's, I'm going to chisel plow, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But if you chisel plow it, you're going to bury it in the ground, but you still might want to do something to it because you want those microbes to be with that material to help them break it down. So we want to be not confusing stock degradation as just residue <coughs> breaking apart. We want to understand how we can influence those soil microbes we want to feed them, we want to keep them healthy, and we want to have them keep a, keep active all through the winter if we can to kind of keep an eye on those carbon-nitrogen ratios, which are so very important for us to understand. So um, we want to understand this, this residue decomposition is not something that we want to take a lazy approach to. I, in my personal feeling and what we've seen in the research, we want to be very active in, in kind of giving them their best foot forward so that they can in turn give us what we want the next year. So, um, and then uh, my next slide, I just have a, a little picture of some of the research equipment we'll, we'll use in these trials. Um, the predominant one is you can see we've got a couple of drills, a couple of planters, but when we're looking at that, of course, I got some different colors in there for everybody's benefit. There's no red tractor, but I didn't have one on there. But when we look at these different planters, different uh, ways of getting the crop in, that's really kind of our approach to looking at residue management. What do we need to do? It really isn't about the color. It isn't really about the type of planter. It's about being aggressive with the material that's out there and to determine what we have in our toolbox, if you want to put it that way, to help promote this residue breakdown. So um, there were some there were some thoughts we had in uh, some of our discussions on on basically residue and what what we're going to do and how we're going to um, uh, uh, go after it. And I thought maybe we could spend a little bit of time now to discuss. Um, what you know different approaches on, on how to do that so one one comment i was thinking is um what can we apply to that residue um and i'm not the salesman and when uh, jessica and jeff they get on they can talk to you about some products that we have used in this in our research program um probably the the first one that's going to jump in my mind is the bio reverse so um, and, I, and I know you guys are going to have some questions, but I, I just there's a couple of thoughts that I want to throw in before we, we we discuss some things and to broaden our our maybe our scope of what we're trying to do. It's not like um, brain surgery, but but it is in a sense. We want to look at are there's um, I could call them sugar sources, which I would call energy, but are there nutrient sources in other words we're going to want to put a nutrient on the residue to get the microbes to feed on the nutrient to keep them kind of that initial um bringing down that carbon nitrogen ratio so it's not 30 to 1 80 to 1 200 to 1 we want to find if there's products that we can apply on our residue 
to bring it down below 24 to 1. So those microbes are going to start being active. When it gets really high, they're going to keep all that those that nitrogen in their bodies, and they're not going to release it. So there's things like the fulvics and the humics and the sugars we can add. Think of those all as energy. Think of those things that we're going to apply to the residue. It's for the benefit of the microbes to do their job. And that is going to help us um, address this issue of this high carbon nitrogen. Obviously, if you think about it, um, going back to uh, agronomy, we sometimes, and I'm going to say sometimes, give soybean a nitrogen credit. And I might want to make a comment about this. Soybeans really do not have a nitrogen credit per se. It's not like they give this free nitrogen to the next crop. What they, what it is, they have a lower carbon ratio to break it down. So you release this nitrogen sooner than a corn crop. And it's more applicable that rotation credit based on a faster rate of residue breakdown than it is just like it's just giving this free nitrogen away. So if we understand why we do that with soybeans, it helps us understand with corn we don't and why we need to be a bit more aggressive with our corn residue because it, it just takes longer to break down. Well, here's another one. When we have a, a, a nice alfalfa crop and we plow it down or we burn it down, oftentimes we'll give 100 plus bushel nitrogen credit to the next corn. Well, it's not per se a perfect nitrogen credit, but it's just that the alfalfa breaks down so much faster that you get a, a, a quicker release of nutrients. So we need to be thinking about that crop to see what it does. Um, so with regards to like a bio reverse, you think of it as you're giving it the energy source to those microbes to break down residue. And also, as we mentioned earlier, when we're breaking down this residue, we want to think that we are potentially decreasing inoculum that could cause diseases on our, on our next crop. So that's kind of my long winded, short, quick and dirty um, comments about um, residue breakdown. And uh, I'm, I'm willing to answer questions or, or uh, anything like that. Thank you, Tim. So uh, one of the questions that we had was, I know you mentioned I did that, I did that with only breathing <laughs> twice. Do you know that? Yeah. <laughs> you did a wonderful <laughs> job. Uh, uh, we we know you've done a lot of work on Bioverse. I know you've mentioned it uh, more than yeah. a few times, but do you have any like specifics of different observations that you've seen through the season after an application of Bioverse that might resonate with the audience? Perfect. Thank you. And it's always good to remind me, because otherwise I'll just pop up. So when, I guess the reason why I just inherently mentioned bio re reverse is because I've been able to watch it. And what I have known, and, and that's why just measuring residue breakdown isn't enough. You have to, you have to follow those treatments through all the way through the next crop when the combine hits the field. And the reason why I say that is when um, I'm measuring percent residue or I'm measuring residue weight, those are just kind of along the way to try to get a grasp of is this particular material helping to degrade residue. But that's only uh, that's the 10% the, the of the iceberg that's sitting above the water. The 90% is what influence does something like bio reverse do to the soil due to the nutrient um, pool, so to speak. But more importantly, what does it do to the next crop? And that's the stuff that I get excited about because of agronomy. So in those trial, in those treatments where we have used the bio reverse, we have noticed an improvement in vigor in the following corn crop. And we've seen it in soybeans too. So we've looked at We've looked at this bio reverse in a corn corn rotation and also in a corn soybean rotation. And I'm the one to kind of push for the soybeans because it's like, well, hey, if it's if it's good for one, why can't it hurt the other? And it's true that it 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 
it improves that vigor. We'll we'll go out at uh, you know V three, V four, V five when the vegetative growth is really getting strong, and we will notice that there is an, an improvement in a darkness of color, a green color. There's a, there's an improvement in in overall vigor of that crop. We've seen it might be half a growth stage ahead. So it isn't something you could say, well, stick a probe in the ground. Um, look at this. I've just measured 10%. It's, it's through observations in the field that we've detected these improvements and could be nutrients, could be um, overall plant health, because obviously if they've got more nutrients, it's going to help the plant be um, um, more healthy. But we've also taken that vigor and we've seen it all the way into yield of the next crop, which we're getting close to doing. That's kind of my long winded answer. No, that's great. And I know we visited the farm and we've had more than a few discussions about it. But like you said, there's more than a few reasons why a stock degradation program works, especially with yeah. one like Fireverse. And yeah. like you said, that nutrient, uh, that nutrient release for the next crop, you know, there's just a lot of things that go into it. And that's what makes it effective. We can't attribute attribute it to necessarily one effect of a residue management program, but the benefits of the whole thing in its entirety help make everything better for the next growing season. Well, and your your comment is right on it. It's the holistic, I can get into weird words, but it is the whole. In other words, think about this. If if we add, let's let's go to soil chemistry. Let's just say you have a a, a a field, and the pH you soil tested the pH is five point nine. Well, guess what? Wheat's going to do okay. Corn's going to do okay. Alfalfa and soybeans are going to hate that. So we can add lime to raise the pH, and you're thinking, well, I've corrected pH. Oh no, you've done more than that. By correcting the pH, we have now moved the nutrients into an availability um, zone, 6, 8, 6, 6, 9, 7.0 pH. But where the nutrients are there, now we've made them available. And that's exactly what we're doing with attempts to break down residue. It's this whole approach that we're not just trying to break the residue down. We're trying to keep the microbes happy. We're trying to get them to eat fast, kind of eat fast and give it all back up. So we could let it happen naturally where it might take one, two or three years. It's like, well, we'd like to invest in next year's crop. So that whole approach is exactly what a stock degradation program is. We're trying to fix a couple things, but by fixing a couple things, it's going to enhance so many more things that maybe we can't measure, um, but we're going to see it as the season goes on. Good. Thanks, Tim. Hey, that's a that's a great answer, you know, and that's one of the things that we like to look at is that kind of that full season approach and that really plays nicely into that and that whole thought process. For uh, sure. Um, one of the questions that Jessica and I will get in and when we make recommendations on using a biological, whether it's our biopass or bio reverse, we always talk about having that initial food source in there and you reference that on the energy side. Do you have a preference, you know, whether it's a sugar, a fulvic, a humic, you know, in terms of that initial carbon source? Actually, um, I, I don't. Um, I think it's important that one of them should be there. So it's really whatever the recommendation is or whatever the producer is happy, uh, most comfortable using. Um, but it, it's the key is, as you say, it's the food source that we're trying to get. And um, I've seen benefits with with all three. Um, I'm I'm kind of a big promoter. I, I really enjoy the Fulvix and the Humix. Um, I've enjoyed working with them over the years, and I'm just I'm continually learning more and more and more about what they can do to the soil, or you know through that that feeding the the microbes and such. But all three of those are inherently much better than just ignoring it and just let it happen naturally. Yeah, I think one of the 
one of the things that you that you mentioned earlier was you know kind of reducing that carbon to nitrogen ratio at that initial source and you know, i think that's um that just kind of sparked that in me because we always talk about having that initial source but you know that really backs that up in terms of why we would want to do that so that's a that's that's great thank you well i, I think maybe the, the, the kind of the uh um farm version think about this so you got a bale of wheat straw sitting over in the corner Take that wheat straw, put it on the pen, and have animals um, urinate all over it. Well, guess what? Which is going to break down faster? So, in a sense, by the animals urinating on that wheat, you've given them a food source, haven't you? Yep. And all of a sudden, we know how quickly residue breaks down when you give it, in a sense, you gave it a nitrogen source to combat the carbon source. And that's really what we're th trying to do with uh, this, the fulvics or the humics or the sugars. We're really doing that mechanically through our, through our management, but we're doing the same thing. That, that wheat, wheat straw, it'll sit in the barn for 40 years and just collect dust. But if you put nitrogen or, or a food source on it, it will break down. And that's really what we're, what we're trying to promote. Thank you very much. So another topic that we wanted to touch on while we have you, uh, you mentioned it briefly earlier in the presentation, but in decreasing the potential of like a soil borne disease, I know we talk a lot about minimizing a host and that can help decrease the likelihood of a disease occurring. You know, if we refer back to that disease triangle, um, what's your experience been with that? Well, we, we know we've got a number of, and I guess, we might as well throw just all pests in with that 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 idea. But think about this. So all diseases have to survive on something. So if we have um, uh, this, this, this residue base out there, it gives the diseases a chance to uh, overwinter, to hide, to reproduce, and just be sitting. I, some diseases have to be airborne. They're going to come in. Uh, from down south, which we can't really control that, but we can control, we can we can manage what is soil borne through this inoculum that we're that we're basically we're continually feeding some of these diseases. So um, yeah, we won't, it is something we should really consider is by degrading this residue. One way is we could all go back to moldboard plows if we want. And we can just bury this stuff. And unfortunately, that doesn't really work good with some of our, our soil management. And, you know, in the, the early spring, it's blowing all over the place. So that was a big promoter of years ago. How would you get rid of weed seed residue? You get your plow out and just bury it. Bury it seven inches down. Well, we need to manage things a little bit better than that. So by degrading this residue by getting these microbes so active on it, it will reduce our, our residue, which is also going to reduce that potential inoculum to the next year. And when we mentioned the disease triangle, you know, there to just describe it a bit for people who aren't familiar, it's there's three sides to a triangle. It's the environment, the host and the inoculum. And if you don't have all three of those sides, then we're not going to have a disease. And if we can minimize one of those sides, then we're going to decrease the likelihood. So basically exactly what you just said, Tim, it, it really puts it into good terms to help it make, make it easy to understand. Well, it, look at this way. Everybody's got this nematode in their soil, and we can deny it, but we surely should. So let's just say every field, think of the disease triangles as every field has potential for cis nematode. Um, and we have weather, we have you know, the, 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 the susceptible host. Well, if you grow corn that year, you might have the other two components of the disease triangle, but you're not going to get cis nematode. So given that with these soil borne diseases, if we eliminate one of those three sides of the triangle, we're not going to get the disease. It's really a pretty simple triangle. And if the, if the three components aren't there, it just isn't going to happen. So that's a good point. Yeah. Maybe one uh, one last question to wrap it up for us for, for us, Tim, would be um, we see a lot of cover crops and, and we'll get questions in regards to um, you know cover crops, you know, not necessarily 
in in this way but you know what we'll see is we'll see a lot of wheat we'll see rye grasses you know something that has a high carbon to nitrogen ratio what yep. are your thoughts on um including you know a bio reverse in that spring burn down application well i have to have to bite my tongue first and add one more thing we got to get these people to, to kill this rye a lot quicker yeah so <laughs> yes i'm getting old enough where <clears throat> Nobody ever told me to let rye go to go to heading before we planted our corn into it. That's just that's kind of nuts. We need to go back to killing this cover crop when it's you know eight inches tall. When it's still a cover crop, it's not going to become an aggressor to the next year. So um, anything we can do, a bio reverse, anything we can apply with our burn down is something that should be just an automatic because we. If we want the, the the benefit of that that rye and and what it could do to weed control or or as a, as a fat control or to weed just all that we if, when we make the decision to terminate it we need to be aggressive with it because I when we and I know this is not really your question but when we get too late with killing that rye. Why do you think we're starting to see flux, fluxes of army worm and a lot of these early season um, maggot maggots uh, or grubs in the corn is because we let it live too long. We got to kill it. We got to get it to die as quickly and break down. So we're not actually creating an, another issue. I, of course, I just gave you my honest opinion, but yes, we really need to have that in the burn down, get that to start decaying that material as quickly as we can. Awesome. Well, thank you very, very much. We appreciate all of your insight and sharing your experiences with everybody. Um, thank you everybody for joining the webinar. Like we said, Tim has been a very great research partner that we've had for uh, more than a few years and we appreciate all of his input. He's been very integral in uh, starting in the and the writing up of our trials and our protocols and a really great partner for us. So again, Tim, we thank you. And if anybody has any questions, I would like to direct those to your territory manager. Um, and as always, thank you for joining. Thank you very much. Have a good day.